I don't think that AI could replace doctors anytime soon. In a huge database, like with tens of thousands like or even millions of samples for different patients, the algorithm could find those cases where, in, in some sense, for example, speaking of cancer, the tumor looked similar to yours. And just based on these um, extra information, the doctor can compare um, your case with the other similar cases. And maybe it also could just supplement, uh, be some supplementary information to enhance this decision. It still could make good use for the precision medicine. Hey folks, by the way, this podcast is brought to you by Anne Jack's Community a welcoming space where any engineer can learn to write better code. Anjax is about helping teams and organizations how to improve the way they develop software by sharing best practices. So they offer plenty of tools, services, and educational programs. So if you are interested, check the links below. Hi folks! So my name is Zuri and here we are talking about different AI applications and various fields with industry experts. So hi Tom! Hi, nice to see you. Nice to see you too. So I would like to introduce you to our listeners. So Artem is a doctoral student in German Cancer Research Center who specializes in computer vision for medical applications. I would like to start with a definition, if you don't mind. What is cancer? If we're talking about oncology, what do we mean? Yeah, so it's a very good question. And I think to answer it properly, we have to go back uh, a couple of uh, billion years to see what life uh, looked back then and what the difference uh, between how it looked back then and how it looks now. Billions of years ago, when their life only started to form, the organisms uh, were mostly single cell organisms, uh, algae, bacteria, and the life path for them was much easier than for us. If you are a bacteria and you have enough resources, enough food, you can just divide and uh, increase your population and that's it. Cells of uh, multicellular organisms, for example, humans, uh, essentially can do that. Because um, imagine if, if you accidentally cut your finger and if you're... Um, of course, to heal your wound, your um, cells will will need to divide. But if they do it uncontrollably, uh, instead of having the, the same finger you had before the cut, you'll have a mass of skin and flesh and muscles and whatever you have on your finger. Because, uh, yeah, the, the, the cells are divided. On. Exactly, what? yes. Mm -hmm. And to avoid that... Um, Evolutionary, uh, we have developed a lot of different uh, mechanisms, different regulations of how cell are how cells are divided, mm -hmm. and all these mechanisms are encoded into them. So the cell has some inner me mechanisms. Uh, the cell gets some feedback from the neighbor cells, from the body in general, and now it uh, can only divide only only in cases where uh, it has to do so, and it does that in a very controlled manner. When there is a task for, right? When there is exactly, a kind of yes, signal. Exactly. Yeah, uh -huh, yes, yeah. exactly. But sometimes, uh, sometimes these mechanisms can break and um, the cell starts dividing uncontrollably. Uh, usually, usually, that's a very worst case scenario for the organism. So uh, these mechanisms are so strict that under usual conditions, if the cell uh, feels that something is wrong with it, maybe some mutations happen, maybe some mechanisms was broken, the cell uh, would uh, rather choose to kill itself rather than to do something um, uncontrollably. It's like more cost effective to kill it than to maintain it, right? It's, uh, I would say, for organisms, it's more like um, a risk manager the strategy. So uh, it's it's rather easy to kill it because all cells are the same, and if you kill one, that's perhaps not a big deal, and the other can um, play its role. Uh, rather than to uh, deal in the future with the consequences of uh, how uh, it should start behaving strangely, or perhaps, for example, uh, start dividing uncontrollably, and for a cancer tumor. So uh, cancers are, um, as we discussed, the, the population of cells that has uh, these mechanisms of um, 
um, regulation broken and uh, essentially do not uh, uh, listen to the orders of the Putin general and uh, instead of working for the, the common good, the good of the entire organisms, they uh, rather selfish, uh, selfishly uh, do whatever they want. <laughs> I got it. So uh, uh, just correct me if I'm wrong. So the main thing is about broken mechanism uh, of division, right? Like uh, the the main thing that they are starting dividing like uh, uncontrollably without any without any requests, as I may say. Yes. So um, that one problem with cancer is that um, unlike. Um, many other diseases. For example, if you have COVID, um, there is a particular virus that causes the disease. But for cancer, um, it could be any cell of your organism that starts this growth of the tumor. And all cells or in, on your organisms are different in the way that the um, like cells that form your brain and your muscles and your bones, and all of them have uh, different features, and all of them could start a cancer. So, therefore, the resulting cancer tumor also would be uh, pretty much different, and that explains why uh, all cancers are, are different, and it's, it's very difficult to find a common solution to treat them. Because cells are different. It can appear exactly, yeah. like in your breast, in your throat, everywhere, and the cells are exactly. not equal. And, um, yes, because of this difference, it's, there's no um, final consen uh, consensus in the scientific community how exactly to uh, define a cancer. But uh, I would say if, if you define it as a um, population of cells that started dividing uncontrollably, that would be a good first approximation. Yeah, you just got my next question, which appeared in my head. Where, why is it so complex to identify that? You, you just partially cover it. Could you please a little bit deep dive in that? What about the treatment and prevention? Why it's so difficult? Yes, I think that's uh, exactly uh, for the reason I mentioned before. So all cancers are different. They originate from different cells and therefore... Um, they have uh, vastly different properties. So they would respond uh, differently to different treatments. Mm -hmm. Some of cancers are more aggressive and less aggressive. Uh, they, um, and because of, of how different they are, it is uh, very important to uh, diagnose properly which exactly kind of cancer does a patient have. And that's uh, sometimes not very easy just because for brain, uh, for brain tumors, for example, um, brain, since it is a very structurally and functionally complex organ, it has um, dozens of different cell types and each of them could be, could originate a um, uh, cancer. So if, if there is a tumor in, in, in your uh, brain, it's sometimes rather different to, to say what kind of cancer it is. So a lot of um, research is devoted to uh, finding more efficient methods of diagnosing uh, uh, what kind of cancer a um, patient has in an effective manner so that then subsequently people can come up with a um, individually tailored treatment. This approach is called uh, precision medicine or precision oncology in this case. And as I know, also their cancer cells that were formed in one place, they can also migrate from the tree, but they, they steal their cells from their region place. For example, if you had some kind of, the, I don't know, throat cancer and some of the cells are going to have metastasis, and there, they emigrate into different parts, but they are still, for example, in lungs, but there it's not lung cancer. There is still cancer which was originated from, example, in different parts, for example, in throat. So I suppose that it's also make it much more complex, to uh, much more difficult to differentiate. Just correct me if I'm wrong. First of all, uh, usually metastasis is... Uh... Uh, rather a feature of a um, late cancer stage. So um, usually, of course, because the cell divide in like a local neighborhood, uh, you would expect that um, when the cancer only starts to develop and it takes, uh, it remains where it uh, originated originally. Uh, but um, yes, since the, um, over time the tumor grows larger, sometimes it, it can form metast metastasis and they could migrate over, all over the body. So, and this is problem. Uh, it's called the um, uh, definition of the cell of origin, like just uh, trying to determine 
um, what was the original cell, the original location this cancer formed. It is also a yet unsolved problem that is you know, rather important for for um, diagnosing a cancer. Now it's more or less clear why it's so difficult. Yep. But uh, could you please elaborate how technology right now can influence uh, the sphere? How can they help to differentiate and maybe prevent uh, the spreading or even maybe just occurring of uh, cancer cells? Cancer, uh, as, as for more diseases uh, perhaps, but for cancer, it is essentially important that prevention uh, is much more important than um, uh, the treatment itself. And by prevention, uh, I mean that, of course, you cannot take a magic pill and it will prevent your cancer to be formed. But uh, if you do, for example, body scans um, frequent enough, uh, there is a good chance of um, uh, finding your uh, tumor at a rather early stage of development, right? when you can, you still can, for example, um, remove it surgically or um, use a not not very aggressive treatment to uh, treat it, and therefore uh, he, reducing the the um, harm uh, to the body overall. And to do so, try to locate uh, and find the uh, cancer on an early stage of development. There are there's a lot of research actually ongoing on. For example, uh, a lot of groups is focused on uh, trying to uh, develop specific uh, analysis that could uh, uh, infer and determine the presence of uh, cancer and which particular cancer it is just from your blood analysis. Hmm. Is it fast right now? So I can just get the blood test and the results will be just in several days? Is I mean, is it like well spread? Yeah, I, I'm actually I'm I'm not quite sure. So I know that uh, such research definitely exists. Mm, uh, I, I I'm, I'm not aware if it actually already made it to the like, everyday clinical practice, but um, when it finally will, I think yes, it it might be um, rather fast because uh, yeah, because diagnostics by the blood test would be amazing because MRI thing uh, is a kind of. Uh, in most of the countries, it's expensive yeah, if it's not under your insurance, for sure. So and uh, and you cannot do it like on a monthly basis, I suppose. So I was working in MRI center as a night administrator when I was a student. And when we had some patients who came to us and asked to scan the whole body, which is quite time consuming <laughs> operation, we were a little bit surprised. Yeah, even uh, especially if there are no doctoral advice for that. Yeah, but people who want to diagnose themselves, they can do it uh, without any doctoral note. So, and uh, is it is it really, uh, how can I say, efficient just to make MRI scans on some kind of permanent basis? How do you think? Well, it, it definitely, it could uh, help to... Um... To find some some tumors on an um, early stage of development, that's true. How efficient this is? Well, actually, I've I've tried to do this a couple of times in my life. Oh, really? So, uh, yeah. but and every single time the uh, people, the staff in the MRI center, they ask me why would I exactly. want to do so? And yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> why shouldn't I? Right? It's it's not an X-ray when you have when it has it can uh, cause potential Damage. harm to your body. Yeah, exactly. It's it's absolutely harmless. So. Um, but you're right that um, even if certain individuals might want to do that, it's it's quite time consuming and it's quite just expensive and yeah, perhaps it's just not feasible for uh, to do for the entire population. But um, yeah, if um, this plot analysis, um, even if it works just in ten percent of times, I think it 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 could already um, saves lives. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Lives. Yep, that's true. Totally agree with you. Okay, so for the prevention, right? So it's clear that we should notice, we should we should diagnose ourselves like in some time on a permanent basis. But what about the treatment? Uh, how technology could help, well, not with the diagnostics, but with the treatment itself? Perhaps the, the most obvious example uh, would be to just um, uh, for the AI to serve as the um, um, as some decision supporting uh, system for real doctors 
uh, for example, uh, still most of the um, diagnosis, uh, most of the um, analysis of your experiment is, is done by the, the real doctors. It could be MRI, it could be your CT scan, it could be your histopathological analysis. The doctor would sit in front of the computer, um, take a look at, at your sample, uh, find some distinct features that only doctors know, know about. And um, using these features, try to determine uh, if there is something wrong with, with your body. But um, at least for me, um, when I get um some, when doctors suggest that i might have a certain medical condition i always try to get a second opinion just because it's um every uh, main decision that would be yeah. made based on this information perhaps could have made in my life yeah so yeah. a cross validation would never harm and i think that even though uh, i'm not think i don't think that ai would could replace doctors anytime soon i think it could um serve as a good um, second opinion just as a um a good a lot of ai tools just could uh run in the background and uh, look at the same samples the doctor did and perhaps when the doctor makes a decision the ai could i don't know i just highlight some area on the, um, yeah. yeah yeah just yeah um, say that you see yeah maybe you have overlooked this like necrotic region uh, in this sample so maybe uh, you should double check and uh, uh, reevaluate your decision yeah, yeah yeah some hidden angles because ai can just absorb a lot much more data that uh, that the doctor i suppose yeah so uh in this case ai can look at the hidden angles and somewhere that probably could be missed out from the doctor's side right exactly so uh it's 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 a little bit boring perhaps because it's nothing new it's just doing the, the, the very uh, same things doctors uh, were doing from monotonous the, uh, you mean? Uh, yes exactly from the beginning of time uh but uh even if we can make like, by using KI, we can win, uh, say, two extra percent of accuracy that still would save human life. So I think even in this context, it's definitely worth trying. It could be even easier, honestly. So um, uh, there um, are um, a family of algorithms uh, that, are con for example, for images, uh, they're called content-based email retrieval algorithms. So as uh, perhaps a good example would be that you can... Uh, upload your uh, the photo of your uh, cat into google and it will give you the similar images of like, similar looking cats and essentially such an algorithm could also uh, make good use in in the medical practice for example if if you have your um, some medical sample um image i don't know like mri for example again um uh, images. If, uh, you mean if yeah, you have like, the data set um, yes, of images? Yes, mm -hmm. For example, yeah, yeah. For example, um, the algorithm could uh, look into a, um, in a huge database, like with tens of thousands, like or even millions of samples for different patients, and um, find uh, those cases where, in, in some sense, for example, speaking of cancer, the tumor looked similar to yours, and say that uh, look, we had this, this, this in this case. And uh, on the statistics, so you know that uh, this treatment helped uh, or this was the um, cause of the progression of the tumor and the result of this. And just based on these um, samples, uh, based on this um, extra information, the doctor can compare um, your case with the other similar cases. And maybe it also could just supplement, uh, be some supplementary information to enhance this decision. So even without AI uh, actually making any predictions, uh, it still could make good use for the precision medicine. Yeah, so there, there is still human in the loop for sure in such a risky field. So we're just pointing, you mean that AI uh, could just pointing out some, some mm, how can I say, some findings? Yep, and the, still the doctor needs to validate it for sure. I, I believe that we're still on the stage when the human in the loop can't be extracted. So for me, it, it, it never replaces. But probably I am not taking into account some of the future facts, which are not, uh, haven't yet. Yeah, but uh, still. So here you are talking about uh, role of AI in treatment, right? So oh, we are still talking about the prevention when you are just looking and finding them. 
So it looks like it looks like treatment already, right? If you have something. So the next step is to yes, get the medicine. More, yeah, exactly. It's more like treatment mm -hmm. already. So um, when we talk about prevention, that that's perhaps early stage prevention. But of course, there's no uh, clear uh, boundary, I would say. Mm -hmm. So let's imagine that we found something suspicious. I'm not quite sure. So after that, as I got it, doctor need to make some tests and to validate yeah, right, the results of the image recognition. So is it like this? Yes. So um, usually um, if, if there is something uh, suspicious in your body, uh, the doctor would uh, take a biopsy. Biops. Mm -hmm. um, yes, a sample of the tissue. And then make some tests, maybe do some DNA sequencing to uh, get a very deep understanding of what sample is. Uh, use some molecular tests to, for example, to test whether in this um, um, sample uh, there is some elevated uh, amount of some protein that for some cancers could be also a sign of, of the progression. So... And by doing all these um, extended tests, the, the doctor would try to finally estimate whether there is like it's just a benign malformation or some actual aggressive cancer. Isn't it uh, uh, benign or malignant? As I remember yes, the word. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, so here it is. It looks like the cancer detection, right? Like object detection task. I mean, uh, from the machine learning. Right. Uh, before we would deep dive in that, I would just uh, I would like to uh, ask this question in any case because I don't know why I feel it at the right place for that. So if we just talked about the prevention and detection, so is AI right now playing a significant role in also the medicine prediction or medicine generation? So is there any kind of maybe success cases that you are aware of of AI and drug discovery. Because as for me, the, the COVID case, when, we, when it was just started in 2020, I was thinking that it could be an interesting use case for the drug discovery, for the drug generation. But somehow I know that there were no kind of uh, successful tries, but maybe, maybe I just don't know about them. So I just wanted to ask if you know any kind of interesting examples where AI was used for the drug discovery in oncology. I'm not aware of any uh, actual drugs that were um, developed using these methods and already um, um, had their way to the um, hospitals. But that might be pretty well perhaps of the fact that I'm not uh, following uh, these topics very, very uh, closely. Uh, but um, yeah, essentially, um, there are major hopes that AI could speed up the process because um, right now already um, for a lot of drugs, the process of drug discovery isn't um, is much different from the way it was um, like hundreds of years ago, maybe fifty years ago. In which way? Um, yeah, um, how different? How it differs? Yes, yes exactly. So. Um, Back back then, it was that he had a team of chemists and biologists, and they uh, they knew that um, they wanted to get a specific molecule that could interact with like certain disease, certain type of cells in a way, uh, and um, they tried to use their knowledge, um, their experience to like, design this molecule in, in this specific way. Uh, but uh, when it comes to science, it, it's always trial and error. So you can't uh, be sure that something will definitely work. So um, even though... checking your hypothesis, you mean. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. and That's what we do in product management as well. <laughs> yeah. I suppose so. <laughs> um, and when it comes to checking the hypothesis, um, of course, one of the bottlenecks is that, that perhaps if you have a team of... Uh, human chemists, you cannot um, check um, I don't know, like tens of thousands of drugs. So you are limited by the amount of time you have. And uh, there always um, was considered to be like, a major problem for the pharmaceutical companies. So uh, therefore, recently, um, 
that has been developed a lot of like the automatic um, platforms, robots that essentially can uh, do the same work the real uh, chemists did. But now they can um, profile uh, much larger um, amounts of these um, hypotheses um, and they try to evaluate the potential um, use as the, the drug of tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of different compounds. Uh, and it, it would be, uh, but still, it, it requires a lot of um, costly experiments and also perhaps quite time consuming. So um, a logical step forward would be to first uh, use the AI of just rank your uh, potential substances in, in, in terms of activity. So even if it doesn't have to generate um, like an ultimate drug that would definitely work. No, even if you have say one um, millions of um, um, candidates for your uh, drug molecule, if your uh, AI can run them uh, and um, um, recommend the, the most yeah, yeah, appropriate just, one, exactly. Even if mm -hmm. it's even if from one million, even even it just chooses the best ten percent. Uh, 100,000 uh, even the ranking algorithm even if it's uh, uh, even a little bit better than random it still would um, like increase your chances to get something meaningful um, in this 100,000 and uh, then you can check it uh, manually with your robots yeah that's actually how most of the recommendation systems are working right that you need to rank some kind of the entities for the user based on some kind of the history uh, engagements and things like that so here it is if i can uh, if we have enough data about our patients and i suppose in such field we definitely have a lot of data and a lot of um insights concerning their blood tests, any other tests, and the whole history of the, of the illness, right? So I suppose the task of the ranking here, if you have the sufficient data set, I mean, the big enough for that, so the ranking task is, yeah, it sounds, sounds very feasible and effective. So if you did it randomly, as you said, and if you find, if you will find even unsupervisedly, you will find some patterns inside of the previous success cases. So yeah, it's it sounds like a working use case. Yeah. So as I got it, the output is the list of the uh, potential uh, patients uh, ranked based on their relevancy, right? Well, it's not in this particular case I described. It's not. It's even before the drug uh, makes it to the patient. So it's just uh, developing um, developing the candidates for the drug that still has to be checked in the laboratory. And it's far group. before the yes, it's far before they long before they can oh. actually enter the clinical trials. There is one uh, very interesting issue you already touched is the other data sets. Um, so. Perhaps uh, one of the reasons why why uh, there is so much hype about AI nowadays is that first of all we we um, learn uh, well, as a like um, human race we we learn how to train large models but we also um, have enough data to train them and for example the large language models they are essentially trained nowadays on the entire internet, internet. and the um, yeah and the image generation. Uh, algorithms they um, they are trained on um, data sets of images that are billion scale and labeled but, also so the difference um, that it, for the image recognition as i know it's much more cost and you need to in order to get the label data even if you label it in a hybrid approach i mean the algorithm and after that people are validating that but still for the computer vision to get this golden data set is much more expensive uh, based on my experience because uh, labeling is still needed indeed but uh, at least for uh, for the common computer vision um uh, tasks for common computer vision problems. These data sets, in, in some form, they already exist. But the um, but the problem for uh, medical AI yeah, is that um, uh, first of all, um, 
generation of medical data sets is very expensive because for example if you if you need uh, a data set of mris to train your neural network at uh, yeah. first of all you will need to have a like army of uh, mri oh, yes. centers exactly um first of all yes uh, that you just need will need a lot of uh uh, MRIs just to like scan all your patients and so on. But uh, another problem is, of course, the data privacy. So um, you cannot just upload the, all the MRIs into internet uh, for your uh, fellow researchers to use in, in their research. That's because uh, um, this this data is sensitive, uh, strictly protected. Exactly. Uh, so usually um, these data sets are stored uh, within the hospitals and never shared with each other. So, um, and how companies solve this problem right now? So they need to get the agreement from each of their uh, patient or they are dealing somehow with the hospitals? Because for me, it's very interesting. As you said, this is super sensitive information. And is it possible that some of my medical information is used somewhere <laughs> without my knowledge? It might be, uh, but um, I have to say that uh, even though uh, it, it seems that this data is highly sensitive, it might not always be so. Just for example, um, consider your um, your genome, your DNA. If if for some research your DNA was sequenced, uh, this of course is a highly sensitive and highly uh, private data, just because it uh, there is a one on one one to one correspondence to you. Uh, and uh, if one, like, for example, sells this data or uh, uses it without uh, your consent, it's essentially a bad thing because this data tells a lot about you as an individual. Yeah, but, but for it can example, be anonymized, right? So we can anonymize it. It can be. It cannot be actually. Like it, it can be. be. Yes, mm. no. Again, it can. It can be anonymized, of course. But um, if. Uh, uh, there are um, because DNA has a lot of information about um, your phenotype, um, and for example, if um, again, if you uh, get a DNA sequencing in another center, and it it could be uh, pretty much easily linked to yours, just because it's kind of it's it's your individual genome. It's different unique. for all people. Yeah, it's unique. But for uh, medical images, like for example, for MRIs or histology images, it's not quite the same. So, um, for example, imagine that you are developing um, an algorithm that uh, is diagnosing skin cancer based on the images of your skin. Like for example, if if the the data set would consist of like a, um, small images of the skin, like say one centimeter by one centimeter, it even though it's medical data, it's not as private because technically there is nothing, there is no way this could be linked uh, back to your personality. So if essentially if, if these data sets do not contain your like legal name and so on, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. they're perhaps not as linkage. sensitive. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. They're perhaps mm -hmm. not as sensitive and as um, some other types of data. So um, in, in this format, um, Essentially, it could be shared with another medical center and train and used to to train AI. And fortunately, uh, it's it's only now that uh, medical centers are slowly realizing that uh, that it is the case, and there is um, not much reason just to sit on this all this data without sharing it. And they, uh, it seems, uh, people are slowly realizing that it would be indeed better to uh, collaborate and. Uh, um, gather all that data together to to train uh, large neural networks that could uh, help the patients get the correct treatment. Would you be okay if your kind of medical data will be used somewhere without your agreement? Just a rhetorical question. I mean, if, if it's, um, again, something uh, unlike the genome that cannot be linked to my personality, yeah, of course, not, not a single problem, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, concerning the data privacy, and uh, also, if we're talking about any kind of certification connected, if AI can help, uh, helps here? Not quite sure how uh, AI could help with certification. Uh, but uh, I would say that actually the certification of AI itself is an interesting case. Because um, all, all the 
because how uh, because of how strictly regulated the the whole medical field is of course all, all treatments or all drugs every procedure you might want to do to your patient it has uh, to go to the, through the clinical trials and to be certified for example by the FDA uh, foods and drugs administration in the US or the um, same regulatory organs in like in the uh, Europe or in any other country and uh, actually uh, uh, the problem was that since um, AI appeared only recently um, no one really uh, know how to certify them because um, if it's a um, clinical trial, the guidelines has been for quite a long time. Everyone knows what, what is the procedure. But if you are the, the legal authority and the company says that we have an algorithm that can uh, use this super black box neural network to uh, um, diagnose a like, colon cancer type, uh, how would you respond? Because you need to check that it's trustworthy, right? So... Um, it took it took some time for for people just to come up with good ways of uh, certifying this, but um, right now I think that uh, there are more and more uh, FDA certified AI based tools to to work with uh, uh, cancers in particular and in the field of medicine in general. So I think that even though right now we don't see any at least many of these. Um, mm, algorithms and pipelines like in real clinical practice in hospitals. I think that uh, in the next five, ten years, we'll start uh, seeing a lot more of them. I'm really thrilling. I really want to talk about the computer vision itself. We slightly touched it in the beginning, but uh, could you please elaborate about computer vision for medical applications? So what makes them different? What, what is the specifics of this approach? Yeah, perhaps a good way to illustrate this uh, would be for me to just talk about my uh, my uh, main field of expertise, the computation of pathology. Please. Um, and to do so, uh, let me uh, first outline what the non computation of histopathology is. Yeah, sure. So um, for, for cancer, still one of the, um, the most widely uh, used ways of determining um, what cancer a patient has would be to just uh, take a sample of the tissue, uh, lay on a glass slide, and you've perhaps all have seen it um, like in, in your school biology classes, like these like glass slides you put under the microscope. And then like a special, especially trained doctor, a pathologist, just looks uh, through the microscope and based on some features, for example, the shape and size of the cells, of the density of the cell packaging, the uh, presence of necrotic regions, for example, and so on. Uh, based they on literally the see it. Right. Yes. Just yes. Exactly. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, the, um, um, these samples are like a stained in a special way to be uh, easier to work with. But yes, they literally look at it with their own eyes, and uh, based on some tissue features, they uh, do the correct diagnosis. So, um, this is how histopathology works. Uh, but um, as we discussed before already, um, one of the um, uh, most obvious application of AI uh, in medicine would be to just um, repeat all these uh, things that usually a doctor does, but uh, uh, connect AI to them just to enhance the accuracy of the predictions. For computational histopathology, it cannot be done naively because, because of the nature of the data. The thing is that um, even though the um, the size of these tissue samples that are um, examined are is rather small, so like a couple of millimeters sometimes, because of how small the cells are. You have to um, zoom in a lot uh, to see individual cells, and um, these um, sometimes, uh, if you want to um, pro your AI to process your um, uh, the, um, your images, you'll have to like, first make these images through the microscope. And the resulting images, they will be huge, just because the, the sample is small, but the cells are so much smaller that in, in every sample there will be like millions and millions of them. And since, as we discussed, the, um, since cancer is a disease that has this cell origin, uh, you really need to zoom in a lot to see individual cells for the correct prediction. And um, 
And that's actually pretty different from um, a normal AI, because if you have uh, your um, your normal neural network for uh, usual computer vision applications, and if you have your um, photo of your dog uh, that you and you want to determine your dog's breed, if the original photo is this, like 4K, you can easily downsample it. Uh, to like 500 by 500 pixels, just not to uh, waste your resources of the, the uh, of your computer. Just because by downsampling it in this way, you don't lose much information. Just because all the important features of your dog will be would be perfectly visible on a like downsized you, version of the you image. You don't need yeah. such details, right? Because uh, why I'm asking because in autonomous driving they have also sensors like cars, and they need object. Uh, they have object detection algorithm for defining like pedestrians, signs, and blah blah blah. But the quality of the cam was one of the most important fact, and the lens itself, if it fit shy or not, because. Uh, if we're talking, for example, about night scenes on the road, so kind of details and the quality of your picture is crucial because it can influence to, uh, it could lead to high risks, right, on the road. But as I hear from your case, if you shrink the spectra from 4K to 5, uh, 500, 500, you won't lose any, any uh, kind of uh, important information for you. Did I get it right? Yes, and that's that's my point. So for a real, like normal real world uh, images, uh, it's perhaps uh, not a big problem if you shrink them and downsize and downsample. But for cancer images, it would be a huge problem because again, uh, the the original size of the images is large, but it is large only to um, contain and resolve all these uh, small features that are cell scale. So you can downsize it. But the problem is that you cannot all also process it as a single image just because they are large. Like, for example, images that I work with can be uh, 100,000 pixels per 100,000 pixels. So they're wow. really large. And you, you physically <laughs> cannot fit them into the memory of your computer, especially of your GPU that I use for training the neural network. So um, people have to uh, come up with the solution just to uh, overcome this absolutely technical limitation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, um, one the, the approach people used um, until recent was that uh, if if you still can't downsize it, you can just uh, crop your uh, image to smaller tiles. Like without downsizing, you just break down your huge image to these 500 by 500 pixels, uh, smaller Cut images. It. Exactly. And then you process them separately. It's like tokenization. Like if we're working with in text, way, yeah. we're doing like, way, like the yeah. same. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is that if you, uh, if you work with them separately, uh, you still can... Uh, you, you still can see all these small um, cell uh, scale features, but um, some information could be lost because uh, the, um, these slides uh, are required to be that large for a reason. For example, if you if you uh, you might have some uh, features on one part of the slide, and then. Uh, on another part of the slide, there will be some necrotic region that sometimes indicates that the um, tumor is on a later stage of progression, and therefore you, it is necessary for you to like look both like on the top left and the bottom right part of the image. And if you emergent it effect, this, it's like an emergent yeah. effect, yeah. And if uh, and if you uh, crop uh, them to like much smaller size, you just cannot fit uh, all all the the context that is required to, to the smaller image. This is interesting that we have the same problem with text. So when you uh, when you have a long long text and you want to be fat into the LLM, so uh, you need to mm, cut it into the botches. But when you cut it, you just do it randomly, right? And you are losing the contacts uh, because there are no kind of semantic linkage between them we don't know where uh, if we lost somewhere in this moment where they were separated so it really reminds me of that so that's like the same problem here until recent uh, this was quite a common approach but uh, the progress is not uh, standing in place it's developing all the time and uh, the the more recent uh, pipelines use uh, 
a pretty smart idea, I would say. So even if uh, we can't uh, fit the original huge image into into uh, the GPU during the neural network, what we could do is we could still uh, cut in, into uh, smaller tiles and then uh, use a pre-trained network for feature extraction, essentially to uh, downsize each of these uh, smaller tiles, cropped images, to uh, say a uh, feature of future vector of uh, much smaller dimensionality and after such a um, dimensionality reduction uh, we actually uh, can um, just combine them back and fit the whole uh, huge image into the gpu and uh, now train the, the neural networks uh, with the um, again with the whole image with all the necessary context so uh, and yeah, these algorithms are quite new. They appeared only like, during the recent years. But I would say that uh, all uh, modern pipelines uh, actually uh, nowadays uh, utilize this idea. So mm -hmm. I would say that... Um, How it's called? Sorry, probably I missed it. Maybe there is a kind yeah. of name for this approach. It's it's called uh, mul multiple instance learning. But uh -huh, uh, I doubt that you have heard of it. Yeah, yeah uh, multiple multitask, instance yeah. learning. Yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, multitask, yeah. multitask is a different, different thing. And it's, it's when you oh, have multiple um, objectives. Yeah, um, could you please elaborate? Oh, yep. It's it's called multiple instance learning for uh, slightly historical reasons because um, um, the problem is that when the sample is cut out of the patient, uh, usually um, it is rather difficult to um, cut on, only the um, cancer tissue. And on the samples, uh, there is also a lot of healthy tissue, or like at least some healthy tissue. And if you, um, again, as we discussed before, if you cut uh, this uh, large image, uh, image, we call them, by the way, whole slide image. Um, if you cut this whole slide image uh, into smaller ones, it might be that even though your uh, label that you use for training is like some types of cancer, it might be that uh, the smaller piece of image, it actually contains only healthy tissue. So you would uh, essentially, uh, if you, you would use your uh, cancer label to train your classifier neural network, you would uh, train it to make an incorrect diagnosis just because this... False yeah, negative. You, yeah, because it's, it's, it's just noisy labeling, I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it it still yeah. worked because um, uh, there were data sets where this amount of healthy tissue were, were not that large, uh, so it worked. So you can use this uh, this examples for testing and validation, I mean. So you shouldn't be trained on them for sure because they don't have any information, right, uh, about the cancer itself. But it can be used for testing, am I right? Yes, but you don't mm -hmm. know which of your samples contain this healthy ah, tissue and which no. So, and that's I, I would, a thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I would rather say that uh, all of them usually contain some healthy tissue and some cancer mm. tissue. So, no, I got yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, this task that imagine you have like 10 or 10,000 for all whatever you have, these small images, and you know that some of them are um, have your like uh, label of interest, like cancer, and some of them are not. Some of them just like just being there for just the sake of being there, like noise in a way. And uh, this um, family of algorithms that um, can uh, train, um, um, say, a classifier, uh, that classifies not in individual samples, but say so-called bags of samples based on uh, the labels that are true only for some samples in the bag. Uh -huh. um, these are called multiple instance learning algorithms. Got it, um, got it. No, I see the difference. Mm -hmm, yep. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, it, these algorithms are not uh, only limited to um competencies of pathology and actually they uh came from the um broader uh, computer vision uh than the normal one but i think uh, here they uh, shine especially bright so uh all the um, current um modern computation of pathology pipelines use this multiple instance learning idea ml yeah so uh, you said that it came from the main 
computer vision to the computational histopathology. Could you tell me a little bit more about the specifics of computer, uh, computational histopathology? No, I would say that uh, actually the... Um... Um, all the specifics are just the most of them are uh, technical limitations that came from the fact that the data is is different from from the um, usual images. Uh, so, for example, for computational histopathology, um, uh, that that would be mostly the fact that the images are huge, and you know you don't know where exactly is your region of interest. And for um, a completely different field for uh, using AI in uh, the MR MRI scans processing, the um, specific would be that the images are like volumetric. They are 3D instead of the 2D image. So um, resources Volume. have to... They yeah, have the three, three dimensions. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, so the, um, the um, researchers have to modify the standard algorithms to, um, to um, 3D be able to cloud. process them. It's, it's not points cloud, it's dense data in a way, but... Uh, oh, yeah, my bias from autonomous driving. <laughs> because they have LiDAR and RIDAR there, so they have 3D point clouds, my mistake. Yeah. But still, this is a three dimension dim dimensions there. So you cannot use the algorithm which you use for similar pictures for this kind of pictures, right? In, in most of the cases, I would say the algorithms are, are rather similar. So uh, sometimes the, the changes are quite subtle to the uh, the changes to be made are rather small sometimes for example in, in uh, for computation use of pathology people have to invent from scratch completely different algorithms just because nothing else works uh, the size is one of the m main specifics right of the computation histopathology if we talk about the methodological differences, then perhaps yes. But of course, the the difference uh, of the content is also quite dramatic. So instead of your cats and dogs and snails images, you have cells and muscles and blood vessels and and so on. But uh, for me, as a um, uh, not not a biologist but machine learning researcher, uh, that's uh, that's actually not that important. Um, <laughs> But because of these, uh, uh, people who are working in computation and pathology, they still have to like do the um, custom pre-train pre-train network just because something that was just trained on ImageNet would it still would work, but the uh, performance would be quite inferior compared to uh, something that was trained specifically for histology images, just just because the the contest is so much different. Pretty often, the the instruments and the approaches. Uh, that um, that are used are exactly the same as for uh, the images in normal computer vision. Uh, for example, um, um, remember I told that that in the MIL pipeline, uh, a pre-trained neural network is used to um, downscale and do the dimensionality reduction of the tiles to um, to shrink the um, feature vector into something feasible. And uh, this is done, um, the pre-trained network that uh, I used uh, for, for the sake of this are usually the uh, self-supervised pre-trained networks. And the, um, the self-supervised uh, networks that are currently used the best one, they use the uh, Dino algorithm that was released by Meta, uh, I think, last year. And essentially, the, the very best um, uh, paper on that that uh, came out recently, it uses the Dino algorithm without any modifications at all. So they just retrain the, the same architecture with the same uh, hyperparameters on, on their medical data, and it just works. Just another question just appeared in my head, uh, probably not directly connected with uh, which you just said, but what do you think if we could really in future meet some open source uh, neural networks for the medical usage, is it is it really possible? I mean, there already are quite some of them, so oh, it's definitely yeah. possible. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, why I'm asking, because if you have um, like uh, open source uh, neural network, you need to reveal all the data. You need to uh, show the data it, uh, this model was trained on. So if we're talking about medical, as you said, if something connected with DNA, it becomes 
sensitive and private, right? But all of those models you are talking about, they are, I suppose, working with non-DNA data, right? I'm I'm not quite aware of the situation of the um, DNA-related fields. Um, um, it would be perhaps reasonable to assume that they indeed don't publish the data. Um, but uh, it is not uh, uh, correct to think that if you uh, release your network, you also have to release the, the data, right? Uh, it's, it's not uh, true for the um, LLMs, for example, like the uh, consider LAMAs that uh, Meta is releasing every half a year. They release the dates, it's open source, but they don't release the data. Previously on the first episode, if you haven't watched, please do, uh, we were talking about music, right? And in the music, that's kind of similar problem there because you have the uh, rights, right? Author rights for your music. And if uh, Natal Network used your music for the training without agreeing with you, right? We were discussing, isn't it theft? Isn't it fair? And what about the open source models, which are used for generating music? So if they should reveal the data sets. So probably my question is not the possibility. It's about uh, is it fair not to release, uh, reveal them? So from the one point of view, it's sensitive and for sure you shouldn't reveal them. But is there any opportunity to open this data with probably anonymized, as you said? It is rather um, common for uh, different medical centers to indeed collaborate and share the data with each other. So it's it's usually still not open source, like fully open source, that you can just go to internet and uh, download it. So usually there is some some procedure of approval. So, uh, but uh, if you're um, like exactly, yeah. mm-hmm. but if if you're indeed an employee of a well-known medical organization, um, it is not a problem to get access to certain data sets. Uh, but of course, um, I think somewhat the situation resembles the situation with labels in, in the music industry. Just because now like, now uh, people also start realizing that the huge data sets of medical data uh, that they have, it might be also a good um, source of revenue. So uh, sometimes they just partner with like some commercial companies and in a way like rent uh, them their data so that they could uh, train their neural networks. Um, so then sometimes they release the the weights, but not the data, just because they want to keep it for itself for themselves. Because it's um, in the future, it could help them to earn some money. For sure, it can be monetized, yeah. Uh, And actually, Artem, I would really like to hear your opinion on the future of the industry. How do you think how AI will change it and how uh, the routine work of your colleagues will be changed after that? Well, most of my colleagues are actually machine learning resources and not biologists, so perhaps for them there will be just more work and more uh, neural networks to maintain. But... um, I think that, um, uh, first of all, uh, we need to wait uh, until the, um, there will be more, uh, like, not um, neural networks as research algorithms, but as a commercially available pipeline that are um, actually easy to use for the pathologist and they, that could help them in their in their everyday work, just because um, it it should. Um, it it would take some time for for the um, doctors to just get used to the instruments and find uh, out the best ways they they could use it in in their works. Um, so because every technology um, takes some time for people to um, for the people to just find the most efficient ways. And um, so I'm I'm not expecting that. Um, uh, the um, field will be moving as fast as, for example, the LLMs nowadays, just because, first of all, uh, um, there's not that much hype. The, the the medicine is much more regulated and also um, we simply don't have uh, that much data and um, uh, the, um, uh, there is... Um, nowhere uh, for this data to get it from so it it is accumulated in like an, an on a natural speed uh-huh. and uh, yeah 
perhaps it's it's good then not everyone has cancer for us to get samples from them um especially especially for the rare cancers and uh, it is actually a major problem for example for my research that uh, f- for brain cancer, we have like, more than 100 of different brain cancer subtypes. And some of them are so rare that uh, uh, some of them, the, the doctors have never seen even once. So like only read in the books. So of course, that uh, that's not the amount uh, of uh, data that you would be happy with when training a neural network. So... Um, but I think that one of the major uh, changes that has to happen in the field is that uh, people should stop being skeptical about it and uh, just agree on the, the fact that it, at some point it will become useful, even if it, it might not uh, seem so. But I think people have mostly agreed on the, the opposite. Um, so, and people should start essentially collaborating and just piling all the data together to create these industry industry sized data sets so everyone could benefit from that okay we see that that uh, it it's going to just enhance enhance their people's work their doctors work their researchers work but how do you think what kind of limitations can be overcome by using ai in your field uh, that's a good question. So, uh, so far we have just discussed that uh, it could copy the doctor's work, but give a couple of bonus percents of accuracy. But sometimes um, the doctor's work uh, involves, uh, uh, for example, for the case of histopathology, something more than just um, looking at the sample under the microscope. Sometimes that there are feature that cannot just be seen with the naked eye. So people do experiments to uh, uh, find out the molecular content of the of the sample. They could even do some sequencing, uh, just because uh, they need more information for making the final decision. And um, these uh, uh, further experiments, it's not uh, uncommon for them to be quite costly uh, and require some specifically skilled personnel to operate the machines and work with the samples and so on. So it is not that common for these experiments to be only available in large medical centers. So some local hospitals could not have access to them. And um, of course, I think the the, the problem is even more um, sharp for uh, the low and middle, middle income countries just because they even in large medical center, they just could not have enough uh, funds to buy all the equipment and operate them. So um, one of the interesting directions AI uh, is um, going to is that uh, people are trying. Actually, one I'm one of these people. That's the main uh, direction of my project. So uh, people are trying to see if there um, we could use AI and the uh, cheaply available data, for example, the uh, histological images that are already used uh, all the time to sort of emulate the the decisions that are uh, usually uh, done uh, with the help of these uh, more advanced experiments, whether we could um, just use the cheap cheap data and AI to extract something that uh, perhaps usually cannot be extracted by just a human pathologist, but maybe AI could do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the enhancing, this uh, dark angles, uh, dark angles, as we said before. Yeah, I would yeah. say it's it's not enhancing. I, I, like To me, enhancing is something like, you know, like incremental. So it just make doing the same thing, but a little bit better. Hmm. Here's mm-hmm. uh, okay. like a principally new thing that you kind of uncover a uh, uh, previously unseen domain of data. Mm, I got it. So this is the next layer, like the yeah, the plus your knowledge. There is a next layer which neural networking pointed out for you, which you probably exactly. didn't uh, exactly. notice. So uh, mm-hmm. um, I think the turn point was a paper that was published maybe uh, four or five years ago when the um, uh, authors uh, try to uh, predict uh, on the um, uh, based on the tissue image to predict the uh, mutations in DNA. Like oh. sometimes you 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 would not expect that it is possible. Like because I mean the DNA is, is something like it, that exists on uh, within the cells, but it's 
uh, it's so uh, far away from like, the, the the tissue. Like there are so many layers of obstruction between them, so you would not expect that it's possible. But uh, sometimes it is. So and then people are well, started to try to ask themselves like what else we could do. Like maybe there is something else people usually uh, don't consider an option, but uh, if we use AI, we could do it. And we can help uh, and save lots of lives by that. And hopefully, yeah, hopefully, yeah, hopefully. Artyom, thanks a lot for bringing light to such a complex, but at the same time, the super interesting topic. And thanks for having me. It was a pleasure for me too. Yeah, see you soon. Thank you. See you.